Life on Earth did not start out with big things like us. It started out small. Remnants of this early history might still be incorporated into all the things that evolved later on. And to find these small remnants, we should look for things at the frontier between life and non-life. Things like viruses, viroids, and plasmids. So let's talk about the DNA of bacteria and the plasmids inside of them and viruses. Let's compare them. Well, this is a bacterium, this green thing, and here's the bacterial DNA. Here are plasmids. These are circular DNA. And then, well, they're viruses. They're not shown. But there could be up to a thousand such plasmids inside of a single bacterial cell. Now, the bacterial DNA is on this size, 14 megabase pairs to 130. Now, notice that this is a kilobase pair scale, so this is a megabase pair right here. So this is where the bacterial DNA, DNA is. This is where the plasmids are in this size scale, and in green here are viral genomes. So they overlap with the plasmids. So in some sense, plasmids and viruses, you could say, hey, they're the same thing. But they're not. These are inside, and these are outside, and then they get inside, then they go outside again. Now, does life mean only cellular life? Often people use the word life and cellular life synonymously. Well, let's go through a plot here, a chart, a list of organisms or structures and the boundaries. So human beings are multicellular life forms. We have skin. We have skin. There's cellular life, single cells, and there's cell walls or membranes. If you're a nucleus, then you have a nuclear membrane. If you're an organelle, you have a membrane around your, the organelle inside of the cells, for example, the mitochondria. And if you're a virus, your boundary is a capsid or an, um, an envelope sometimes. So all viruses have capsids, but only some have envelopes. Now, there are also viruses of viruses, called virophages. They have capsids, just like other viruses. And then there are satellite viruses. They have capsids. Then there's things called plasmids, which we talked about, the circular pieces of DNA inside of a bacterium. And they're naked. They don't have capsids around them. They're inside cells. And then there are transposons and large non-coding RNA. Those are naked and inside cells, just like plasmids. And then there's microRNA and replicons, and that's naked and inside cells. And then we have viroids. Those are naked, but they're outside and inside cells. That's the difference. Now let's look at the, the discovery of viroids was the third major expansion of the biosphere towards smaller living entities. So the subvisual world was discovered by Leeuwenhoek with a, with a, he discovered microorganisms with his microscope in about 1675. And then we have submicroscopic viruses. There, you can't see them with just a, an ordinary microscope. And that was in 19, 1892 by Ivanovsky. Prim uh, primarily, no, pr at first by the tobacco in the tobacco mosaic virus. Then the subviral, these are viroids. These were discovered in 1971 by Diener in the potato spindle tuber viroid. Now here's Theodore Diener, and there in his red circle is a potato spindle tuber virus DNA. It's a short segment of black there, and here's another piece of it right there in the photograph behind his head. Now, just for comparison, you see the T7 DNA there in yellow? Well, that comes from an organism that looks like this, a cauliflower T7 DNA. And that double-stranded DNA in black there is the same in both of those images. So, viroids are plausible living fossils of the hypothetical RNA world. That's what Diener uh, has said. Now, that's interesting because we're interested in the origin of life. So Flores, in a 2012 paper, wrote, viruses and viroids share the most characteristic property of living beings. In an appropriate environment, they're able to generate copies of themselves. Who? In other words, they are endowed with autonomous replication and evolution. It is in this framework where viroids represent the frontier of life, an aspect that should attract the attention of anybody interested in biology. Notice there are 246 to 467 nucleotides in viroids. And he's saying, he's making a big claim here. First of all, he's saying that they are autonomous replication. Most people would say, oh, no, they can't. They need something else. But every life form needs something else to, rep to reproduce. 
Now here, the 359 nucleotides of the potato spindle virus. Um, and there it is, C, G, G, A, A, C, U, blah, 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 blah. And that's the primary structure. If you, if, when it is uh, coded, it, well, the secondary structure looks like that. And you notice it looks like double-stranded DNA except for some loops there. And the yellow are things found in other viroids. Now, viroids are at the frontier of life, and RNAs are lifeless transcripts of DNA. This is what Diener has said. He's saying, my viroids are at the frontier of life. They are important. They are life forms. But RNAs, inside of cells, are lifeless transcripts of DNA. So here's what he said specifically. Even today, subviral agents, my viroids, are often wrongly conflated with large non-coding RNAs because of their similar sizes. But that's a terrible mistake. It's equivalent to considering humans as life-size mannequins with life. So in disregard of the fundamental fact that large non-coding RNAs are lifeless transcripts from cellular DNA, whereas viroids, like viruses, are exogenous, that means on the outside of cells, autonomously replicating RNAs, which with lengths of 246 to 401 nucleotides are at the frontier of life. So he's saying, my viroids are more important than these pieces of RNA floating around in a cell. But some people would disagree with that. And these two people would disagree with that because they study the non-coding RNA. They're trashing the old rules to forge new ones. And uh, they've made a very long list of different kinds of non-coding RNA with sizes ranging from 22 to 118,000. And here is that very long list. Go read the paper if you're interested. Now, Czech has also written another paper about the RNA world in context where we have complex, there are two RNA worlds. The first is the primordial RNA world. That's this one here. It's a hypothetical error. We're not sure about it yet. When RNA served as both information and function, information and function, both genotype the information and phenotype the function. So here's that RNA world. And the second RNA world is that of today's biological systems here, where RNA plays an active role in catalyzing biochemical reactions, translating messenger RNA into proteins, in regulating gene expression, and in the constant battle between infectious agents trying to subvert host defense systems. Now, here's the first RNA world, and here's the second. This is us. This is you and me, and this is one, the bygone era. But notice you can get something here coming and being still alive here, for example, inside of us. These ribonucleoproteins are something that may have come from here, but they're inside of us. It seems likely that the most recently evolved functions of RNA involve regulation of DNA, right here. Because there would have been no DNA to regulate. There's no DNA here, so there would be no DNA to regulate. So the discovery of viroids was the third major expansion of the biosphere towards smaller living entities. One, two, three. But maybe we can talk about a fourth uh, RNA world and ribozymes being. And then in 1982, they were discovered. And in examples are self-splicing RNA in tetrahymena. So there are very different types of organisms here. Microorganisms, viruses, viroids, and now ribozymes. But don't tell Theodore Diener. Kunin has also been a world leader in writing about these things, and virus world as an evolutionary network of viruses and capsidless selfish elements. And he wrote, among all known replicons, viroids come the closest to what one would envisage as a vestige of the RNA world. They are small RNA molecules that encode no proteins, but replicate autonomously and vigorously. Viruses appear to have evolved from capsidless selfish elements, and vice versa, on multiple occasions during evolution. So if we are to compare, if we are to look at the tree of life with eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea, actually two things, <laughs> the archaea, including eukaryotes and bacteria, there's the root. But that does not include viruses. It only includes cellular life. So what happens when we try to include viruses in the tree of life? Well, that's written in this paper here. And here's the eukaryotes, archaea, and bacteria. And here are the viruses. So the LUCA of cellular life is right here, and also in this red oval. But the LUCA of all life, including viruses, would be right here. 
there's a big difference between the LUCA of cellular life and the LUCA of life including viruses. Well, let's go a step further. What about including viroids and plasmids and non-coding RNA in such a tree? Well, that's a difficult thing. Maybe that's a job for future biologists like you. <laughs> but suppose we discover a planet with an RNA world, but no cellular life. Now, if viruses are not life, then we haven't discovered life. But if you include an RNA world and viruses in, in the life, then we have. So have we discovered life self elsewhere when we've discovered such a planet? I'll leave that as a topic for discussion. <laughs> Maybe ribozymes, plasmids, and non-coding RNA are living fossils, small remnants of the origin of life that are incorporated into cellular life in much the same way that mitochondria, once free-living bacteria, are incorporated into us. Viroids, then, would be the still unincorporated remnants of the origin of life, wild and free.